Yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Nazarin Makinejad. Uh, I'm a senior applied machine learning engineer at Snorkel AI. I've been here for around two years now, and I'm excited to talk about uh, Snorkel flow and introduction to programmatic labeling and show you a demo at the end. I would like to start by uh, speaking about the motivation and why programmatic labeling. I'll then explain how it works and then validate it by talking about some proof points from our customers and how well it works. And at the end, I'll go through the demonstration and how we can use it today. So I'll start by the motivation and why programmatic labeling in the first place. Well, let's just start at the very uh, elementary part of like the goal of AI, which is really mapping an input of any kind, for example, conversations, uh, input in the terms of contracts, reviews, articles, or images, or a situation and a context, and then mapping it to an output, like a decision that needs to be made. For example, what type of input data this is, is there a specific amount that we want to extract? Is it like about the topic topic of the article, et cetera? So it's really uh, about that mapping from the input and output that describes the goal of the AI. And um, what we have is an actual expert human. So an expert human is someone who knows based on background and experiences that given this specific input, this should be the output, this should be the decision that needs to be made. However, what we want at this point is uh, to have an expert model. This is a model that can either replace the human or augment the human like a, a co-pilot uh, that can do that mapping from the input to the output. And what we need uh, to do here to basically uh, have that expert human uh, transfer to an expert model is basically to transfer the domain knowledge efficiently from the human to model. So we want to understand what is the logic of the expert human, what they know and translate that to something that the model can learn and then they can do the work of the expert human. So this is all like what we need to transfer domain knowledge efficiently. For machine learning, what has uh, happened is that we want to transfer the domain knowledge via training data. We know that the models can be in form of neural networks, logistic regression, they are explained by uh, parameters. But in the end, the way to learn the domain knowledge is through training data. So they have to see training data, like given this input, what the output should be so that they can be trained and understand to make that final uh, decision. And in order to get that training data that is enough for the model to learn, we need to have an expert to go through the data. So right now, uh, the legacy approach is to go through the data one by one and by hand. So someone, an expert, will go through the data one by one saying that this belongs to class yes or no or other categories and uh, create this training data that then will be used to be fed into the machine learning model. However, there are many issues with manual labeling. First off, it's very slow. So we still need uh, the humans to go through the data one by one. It's linear, it's really capped at the um, capacity of like the human and they can just like do this at a specific speed and it cannot be like faster at some point. And then secondly, it's expensive. We really uh, requiring a, a lot of time from um, subject matter experts to go through this data and a lot of data needs to be labeled. So at the end, it's going to be a very expensive technique. And then third, expertise is required. So some tasks are easier. And uh, for example, classifying between cats and dogs, you can outsource it to random people and they can just like give the right label. But most of the time in enterprises, in organizations, there are data sets, there are use cases where it really requires the expertise of specific people. So having this expertise is very important and you can't just outsource to somewhere else. The fourth uh, challenge is the privacy. So, um, for example, in healthcare, patient data it needs to remain private. It just cannot leave the organization. Just needs to be labeled in-house so that there is no privacy concerns. Also in finance and many other industries, privacy is an, uh, a, an important thing. And then it's not adaptable. So when you are manually labeling, uh, you have to go through things one by one. If something, if a business requirement changes, then uh, you, for example, have to add a new class or add multiple classes. 
you just have to go back and relabel everything one by one and from scratch. So it's not easily adaptable. And then lastly, it's not governable. A lot of organizations require the need for governance on the data. Where did it come from? Want to make sure that the data is not biased. What data did it uh, go through? So if you just like ask people and they say, I don't know, I just got this labeled data, it just um, is not acceptable. You really need to have this governable practices in place. So given all of these uh, challenges with manual labeling, now I want to uh, uh, discuss the idea of programmatic labeling. Programmatic labeling is a labeling approach where labeling functions uh, that are introduced in the next session uh, encode domain knowledge, and the domain knowledge is the expertise that the model needs, and uh, are used to automatically label training data. And the training data is basically what we need to teach our ML models. And uh, I don't uh, like the word automatically. What happens here is that we really need the expertise from the humans here in the loop so that we can create these functions that then will be applied on scale to lots of data. So it's in somehow a programmatic approach. And then the result of uh, doing this is uh, having this labeling machine. We're basically having this training data development process that is not only faster and cheaper, but also it's reproducible. You really easily can adapt it. It's private and governable, and it typically yields a higher quality model. So where did programmatic labeling begin? Uh, Snorkel team pioneered data-centric development methods, including programmatic labeling over a decade ago at Stanford AI Lab. And it all came from the fact that models and uh, infrastructure, Harvard, ha have all been a commodity. And what is really important here is the uh, fact to have a good uh, quality uh, labeled training data. So it's all uh, really the focus of the data-centric approach. The research by Snorkel has been published in over 100 academic papers and it's been funded by top institutions. So for today, I, I will be talking about programmatic labeling, but the same approach can be applied to other data operations as well. You can use programmatic cleaning or slicing the data, just get uh, a specific part of the data or sampling to get a specific distribution, filtering, filtering your bad quality data out, or augmentation so that you can increase uh, your data set size or generate synthetic data. And at the end, again, uh, work has been uh, peer reviewed and lots of papers from Snorkel team. And in the right framework, data development goes from ad hoc pre-processing hacks to a scalable and systematic software-based process. Now, where is programmatic labeling used today? It's been actually deployed in a lot of uh, ML forward organizations such as Google, Apple, Intel, US Department of Defense. It's also being used to enable doctors, scientists, journalists to unlock new ML apps. And it's also being taught in textbooks right now around like what is programmatic labeling and uh, what are the benefits to that. Also, uh, not only in academic institutions, but also it, it's been used uh, at a lot of uh, Fortune 500 companies to drive value out of a lot of ML tasks. So now I would like to go through the explanation of how programmatic labeling works. I'll start by talking about this example on creating a spam classifier. So on the left, we have a spam and on the right, we have ham, which is uh, something that is not a spam. Now, there are several different cues that we can use here to say that something is a spam or not. For example, on the left, we see that there is an uncommon domain, there is an overly formal greeting, there are typos, there are hyperlinked to unstruct, uh, untrusted site, and it's talking about money. Now that we are uh, all users of email for a really long time, we've been trained and we know that these are the things or logics that we use to say something is a spam or not. Whereas on the right, we know like uh, who's the source. I, I know that person. This is a personalized message. The topic is relevant. This is about asking for a meeting and also uh, it matches with events in calendar. So I'm, I can use all of these different logics that I've really gathered throughout the years or through training. And I understand like why we can say something is spam or ham. Now, in order to build this spam classifier, there are two options. I can either trust all of those logics that I explained and just keep the labels, say that, okay, from these two, I have the label spam or ham. 
and now throw in lots and lots of these examples uh, in my model so that it will at the end learn whether something is a spam and ham. However, a second uh, more preferred option here is to capture the domain knowledge in a form that can be really scaled and reused and adapted. So I don't want to throw away all of the logics uh, that are explained here, but I want to keep them so that I can go back to it later on. So that if someone asks, why was this uh, labeled as spam? You can just quickly say that these are the reasonings behind uh, this particular email being labeled as spam. So there are different ways you can uh, create labeling function. Labeling function is just a function that takes a data point as an input and it outputs a proposed label or it abstains. It says, I don't know the label. And in order to create that labeling function, it could be really easy uh, heuristics such as pattern matching. For example, if you saw a phrase like send money in the email, then say it's about uh, you know spam. Do Boolean search or database lookup. For example, if the sender is in this blacklist database, then it, uh, it, it should be filtered. It should be class spam. You can use legacy systems output. You can use a heuristic such as if spell checker finds more than three spelling errors. Crowd labels. So if you already have some labels from before, you can use that as one source of signal, as one type of labeling function. Embeddings can also be very useful. Embeddings are looking at the semantic similarity of the different data points so that you can use that as one source of labeling function. Also LLMs and prompts. You know that they're a very hot topic these days. So we are just leveraging them. We ask GPT-3 and if it says, Yes, this is a spam. Let's just take that vote and uh, use that as one type of labeling function. These are just like some samples, but just think of labeling function as a function that is encoding our knowledge in term of a code that then can be applied on scale to millions and millions of data. Now the point is that, okay, we're creating these labeling functions. They cover just a part of the data. Uh, they can conflict. Uh, they are noisy, they're not perfect, then how to reconcile them? And this is just like showing you that each one of these OVALs are a um, sample labeling function. They can just like cover a part of the data. They can uh, overlap as you see here or here. Now we want to know like how to reconcile them. Well, basically here for each data point gets a vote from different labeling functions. And each vote from a labeling function, we can also call it a weak label. These are weak signals coming in. So these labeling functions can be correlated. Maybe they're voting the same most of the time. So there's high correlation, uh, but they're not independent. They can also like have high conflict um, so that it shows that it's like low accuracy. They can also have low coverage. For example, this LF is just voting on two data points, but it has high accuracy. So we, we can see that there could be lots of variation in the ways that the labeling functions are voting. Now, in order to see like what is that final label, uh, for example, here we have this prob probabilistic label now for the data point x1, what is the final label given all these labeling functions? This is what we call the label model. The label model is a mathematical algorithm that can be used to solve this aggregation problem. It can aggregate all of the labeling functions and give you the final uh, confidence weighted uh, vote. So this has been uh, created by the Snorkel team and other researchers. And I don't want to get into the details of this. A lot of the work has been published in a lot of uh, conference papers. And there are other techniques that have been developed at Snorkel itself. But basically in the platform, based on the problem specs, for example, how many classes are they? What is the use case? The right label model will be chosen and it will aggregate the different labeling functions, looks at the agreements, disagreements, and denoise them and gives the final probabilistic uh, label. So here the goal is to really toss in all of your rules, all of your labeling functions and combine them automatically. We don't want something like uh, on the left where it's like a decision tree of saying that if LF1 and LF2 voted spam and LF3 did this and LF4 did that, then vote spam, is all being taken care of behind the hood in Snorkel. So given uh, write the labeling functions, collaborate with the subject matter experts, and then it will automatically realize what is the final confidence weighted vote. Here are the steps again. 
we have we are creating the labeling functions to create a training set for a more uh, powerful ML model. The labeling functions are the noisy uh, weak labels. We use the label model to denoise the labels and figure out what is the final programmatic label. And now we are using this part of the data that's programmatically labeled and train an ML model. Now that ML model is something that we can put into deployment as well. That uh, ML model can uh, get predictions on all of the data. This is something that uh, can be used on online streaming data or uh, batch offline data as well. But basically what you can do is now train an ML model that can cover all of the data points. How does this relate to foundation models? Basic foundation model is something that you can leverage here as well. So one, one point is you can either use a foundation model for the end ML model uh, tuning. So if you're, uh, for example, having the final ML model, it could be either a logistic regression model or it can be a GPT-3 model that is fine tuned. However, you can also use the foundation model's output as one source of signal or uh, one type of uh, labeling function in the platform. You can either use warm start or use prompt builder. I will show you in the platform how this looks. This is a case study um, in one of our papers, Better Not Bigger, where uh, when we wanted to show that how distilling FM knowledge into a specialized deployable model works. Uh, as an example, you can prompt GPT-3, FLAN, or some of these large language models and ask questions. For example, what is the label corresponding to this document? And then use these labels to train a smaller model. In this case, we trained a Roberta model. And then we figured out that by distilling down the knowledge from these large language models to a smaller model, we we're able to uh, get to a high quality model that costs 0.1% of these big models in the first place. This model is much, much smaller, it's faster, and is achieving the same quality. This is another case study on product attribute extraction, where from a cat uh, catalog, you want to extract things, for example, like uh, water resistant or stain resistant. What we do at the beginning is to just prompt the GPT-4 out of the box and see how it performs. It started with 50 F1, which is not bad, really. It's just like getting up from zero, right? And then the next step is to do advanced prompting. It's like asking some questions, for example, saying, you are an expert here and think step by step and doing some of those prompt engineering in a matter of like dozens of hours to increase its performance up to 68. And then the next step is, if you can leverage that and uh, fine tune a much smaller model. And then we realized here that by training a much like 10,000 smaller model, we're also able to uh, push the performance up and get to 84 F1. Validation, how well does programmatic labeling work? Um, we talked about why and what, and now we are talking about how. We've seen real world impact delivered by Snorkel. It has been used at a lot of uh, institutions, industries, across biotech, pharma, insurance, oil and gas, manufacturing, et cetera. And what we've seen is that there is a lot of faster development. You get to label data points, like millions and millions of data points in minutes rather than years and years. So it's a lot of savings in person days. And also you get to go from zero to one to build an ML model in just a matter of few days, rather than that being a matter of months or years. There's a lot of cost savings in the way. And also you're getting something with a high accuracy that you trust and you can put into production to be really used by either doctors, in finance, anywhere. These type of domain specific AI solutions can have various type of you know, ML tasks. So the data that we've seen is usually uh, around text. We also support image, but in text, it could be text documents, native PDFs, web data. And for the tasks in Snorkel Flow, we support text classification, text extraction, relation extraction, also image classification. And then we also have another offering around Snorkel Custom, where it's more about the generative AI tasks, such as text generation, summarization, enterprise search, et cetera. Uh, let's go for the demonstration, the fun part. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to quickly mention this uh, Snorkel Flow uh, development platform where first we are starting with our data. Data on the left will basically we can connect to any of your, you know, the way that data can be fed in. Uh, and then we want to also have the knowledge sources. And then if you want to attach any foundation model, that also works. And then in this Snorkel Flow 
uh, the way we can do this uh, faster right, AI development is really by understanding and discovering where are the errors that the model is making. So we can have this guided error analysis tool to figure out and pinpoint those error and problematic parts, uh, quickly go back and correct them, make programmatic feedback and labeling, come back and do this uh, discovery again. And we're doing this in a loop until we're happy with the final results. And this is something that we can deploy. At the end of the day, we can either uh, deploy and uh, uh, extract an adapted FM, like a fine-tuned uh, foundation model, or a distilled ML model, or you can just extract the high-quality training data. So now let me go through the demo and show you how it works in practice. For this task, I wanted to show you a simple classification uh, use case where we want to classify chatbot utterances. So this is one of the use cases we did with one of the top 10 US banks. And uh, we wanted to uh, classify each one of the utterances in one of the 77 different classes. So for example, here, it, if it says, if I need delivery on a certain day, is that something that could be accommodated? This could be one of the 77 different classes. All of the classes are shown here. It could be one of these. So we don't have the ground truth right now. And you can imagine that if um, I was the subject matter expert, I would need to go through all of these uh, examples one by one and select the right ground truth uh, to come up with all of those manually labeled training data that I can use to train my ML model. But what I can do here is to start this process of creating labeling functions, training a model in the loop and do error analysis. And I will show you how that works. So at the beginning, I wanted to start by prompting a large language model out of the box and see how it performs. So if I go to this prompts part here, then I will have these, uh, you know, template, you get to choose among different templates and you get to choose among different models. For example, Flan from Google, um, from OpenAI, GPT models and uh, Palm models from Google as well. So for here, I'm going to choose a Palm uh, model from Google. Vertex AI LM, and then this is a template that I'm using. It says the possible labels are one of these 77 classes, and then I'm asking the question, what is the label of the following document? And the document is in the column text. Now, let me run this on uh, all my examples here. So by uh, creating this prompt, I am actually have uh, chosen this specific model. Now this is being applied to all of my data points one by one, and I can just like really quickly see how this LLM out of the box performs. So now I have these uh, performance uh, down here. Uh, my screen is a little bit small, so I can't uh, go through them, but what I see here is some of these metrics such as uh, precision, uh, coverage and recall. And then uh, I get to really like make some decision. If, is this something that I can just put into production? Am I okay with the costs? And then you can go from there. So for, by just looking at this, I know that uh, this precision is not high enough. 65% is not something that I can just trust. But what I can do is to keep this, uh, keep this work and instead of throwing it away and just use it as one source of signal, one type of labeling function. If I click on create prompt, this will just show up in my labeling functions. And I've already done that. So now the output of this uh, large language model or this Paul model from Google has now been saved as one source of signal, one labeling function. And now what I want to do in the next step is to train a model based on the labels from this LLM and see how I can distill it down to a smaller model and how that smaller model really works. So I have this part, this modeling part, where I can click on train a model, and then I can choose between different model architectures, such as XGBoost, logistic regression, k-nearest neighbor, distilled bird, et cetera. If there are other different models that you want to train, you can do that. We have uh, SDK access from notebook here, where you get to attach a notebook to a specific application, and then just add in your specific models. You can also do the same for accessing a specific models like open source or other closed source models from this drop down menu as well. For here, I have trained an XGBoost model on top of the labels or noisy labels from this um, LLM. And after training that model, because it takes like a few minutes, I wanted to get ahead of it. I've already trained it. And I see that what is the accuracy or F1 score on my validation set. 
I see that my accuracy on my valid set is 60%. It's still not high enough. I want to get a model performance high enough so I can put it into deployment. So the next step here is to really go and see where the model is making a mistake and how can I make improvements? It's like that discovery part of guided error analysis and really drilling down into different parts that the model is making a mistake. There are different tools that you can use here. One is clarity matrix. You can use confusion matrix, uh, class level metrics to really drill down and seeing uh, which classes are particularly uh, really struggling and which ones should be uh, put the most effort on. I'll focus on this clarity matrix because it's something that we can see like how the labels in the first place uh, are, how good they are, and how the model's predictions are. So in the rows, I see programmatic label output, whether they're incorrect, correct, or low confidence, meaning that the label mod model wasn't confident about them and it abstained. And also on the column, I see the model's prediction as either correct and incorrect. The red areas are like where we want to really focus on. And this part is like basically suggestion to refine model is something that we've seen that a lot of data scientists spend a lot of time to go back and re refine, make that model better and better. But at the end of the day, it's really your data and how much of a good quality data that you have that goes into the model. I will now show you by example, how we can, how we're really drilling down and how we can uh, create labeling functions based on these data points. So let me go back to pattern here so that we can see the data. If I click on this part, this is basically talking about uh, incorrect input, incorrect output. It's like garbage in, uh, garbage out. It's like programmatic labels were bad in the first place, model didn't learn, and it made incorrect predictions. So right now I'm lo uh, looking at these 89 examples. And this is a place where I can also discuss with subject matter experts to understand what source of signal can I gather from here to uh, have better curated data so the model will learn in the next phase. If I go to this uh, snippet part, then I, I can sh uh, see them at a more higher level view where if I just like uh, go through and scroll here, I can see patterns. So as an example, here I see that there is a pattern around balance not updated after bank transfer. There are four examples where the model is making a mistake, it's not correctly classifying them, and also the LF votes in the first place was incorrect. The LF votes are coming from this LLM model in the first place. So that Paul model was not able to correctly classify them, it gave a wrong uh, vote, and the model didn't learn. So what we can do here is to go through and only drill down to these examples and figure out what additional signal we can give it. How did you get the confidence level of a label? So the confidence uh, levels are already calculated. It can ha uh, have different levels, but then we have a threshold that we apply and say that if it's like more confident than this specific threshold, then let's keep that. Otherwise, we'll say it's low confidence and we don't want to use that in our label training data. Another person is wondering, is the ground truth manually labeled data? Yes, the ground truth should be the manually labeled data, but in training, you don't need to have any manually labeled data. Basically, the only place that we require having labeled data is in your test set or in validation set, where we want to really validate the performance of the model that we're training based on these programmatic labels. So the training data can be all um, having no ground truth and it's just all uh, programmatically labeled. But then at the end, when we're training a model, we want to validate it against a gold standard that has been created by an, a human expert. Cool. So um, right now, uh, looking at these four examples, I want to go and look at the text. So for example, this one is talking about the transfer missing. This one is also talking about a transfer that hasn't arrived. This one is talking about a transfer not showing and a transfer that has not showed up yet. So by just looking at these, I can go ahead and create a labeling function to encode this knowledge that I have around something about the transfer that didn't work out. And the way I can do it is by clicking here on the slash, it shows me a bunch of different labeling function builders I can use. As I also talked in one of my slides, you can use keyboard base, regex base, counts, and uh, like numeric ones, crowd worker, dictionary, external model as well. In this case, I just want to go ahead with a, a full text regex labeling function. What I want to say here is that in the text, if you found a um, pattern, that matches transfer. And also if you saw transfer and now let me chain it with another condition here 
and say if it also contains something like missing or arrived or showing or show up, then label that as class balance not updated after bank transfer. Then I can click on preview LF and then see the example data points that this labeling function is voting on and then get some high level metrics around precision and coverage. Again, this is a very quick way of uh, saying that right now I don't want to go, go through all of the examples one by one and apply this logic, but I can just like create a labeling function and a code out of this and apply this on scale. So if I have millions of data points, it will exactly find them that has this ex uh, specific pattern and give them this vote by this labeling function. Precision is 100%, coverage is 0.6%. It's a good thing and we can go ahead and uh, create that LF. But again, we don't need these LFs to be uh, highly perfect. They can be noisy, but we just want to really use all of these different sources of signal. And the good thing here is that you really have that knob to turn around for whether you want to increase the precision or whether you want to increase the coverage. It really is a trade-off. At the end of the day, having both up is a really good thing, but we'll just start by experimenting like how we can uh, get them both up. So then we can go ahead and create this labeling function. It will show up on our list of LFs here on the uh, left. And uh, then we can continue doing this. So if we go and scroll down, we see other parts of the data that the model got wrong. And we can do this again, look at the text, see what are the specific patterns that we can come up with. Again, collaboration with the SME is very important here. And then write another labeling function so that we're curating a label data set that is a better representation of our classes and that the model can learn better from. I also wanted to talk about another way of creating labeling functions, which is embeddings. So in embeddings, basically, uh, we can apply an embedding model to our data points. And now we want to cluster these uh, uh, embedded data. Snorkel will take care of clustering the embeddings uh, for us. And it's just like really looking at how semantically similar the different data points are. So if I uh, scroll through different clusters, I can see uh, like, you know, we can just like in 2D also see how these clusters look like. But we also see the top n-grams in each cluster, what they're talking about, what is the precision, what's the coverage, and we can also go ahead and create and use this as a labeling function. So for example, this one precision is 50%, it's not high enough, but this one is talking about a Visa or MasterCard. We can go ahead and create a labeling function based on this. So I can save cluster LF, and it will show up on the labeling fun function panel. You can do this and go through these one by one and see if they make sense. This is one other type of labeling function. So it's not, it doesn't have to always be based on heuristics or patterns in the data, but it can also use the semantic similarity of the data points. So then the next step here is to, now that you've seen that we've added different labeling functions, you can go ahead and uh, add more data here. Um, the next step is to go ahead and train a model. So now that I have added more labeling functions, I'm getting more labeled data. Now my label data is better curated. So let me go ahead and train a new model. You can go ahead and train the model as before, like an XG boost, and see how it performs. Well, basically I have done this and I have the results here. So the second model that I trained based on the XGBoost model is now performing better. The accuracy has gone up by uh, around 2%, which is good, but the work has not stopped yet. I have just gone through like one uh, or two rounds of iteration here, but uh, the next step is to go through the analysis again, find out where the model is making a mistake, create a new labeling functions or refine the previous ones until you get to increase the performance up to a level that you're happy with. And at the end, you can export the model. You can either export the training set labels so that you can train your own model in-house, or you can just go ahead and export the, the whole end-to-end uh, -end workflow. So it will be uh, exported as an ML flow model that you can just put in, into production, given a uh, input, it will just give you the right output. And then, um, I wanted to show you another use case based on using PDF. So we also support PDFs, either scanned or native PDFs. And the nice thing here is that we get to keep the uh, structure of the PDFs the way it is. Like if you have a, a table or different paragraphs, you can just view them as is. And you're not losing a lot of this uh, structural information. 
And uh, let me just like toggle this uh, rich doc off. This is how you see it if you just like scrape the text out of the PDF documents. But with this uh, uh, the representation, you get to use a lot of these um, metrics around like what's in the same column, what's in the same row. For PDFs, again, you can prompt them. You can use a, a model from OpenAI like GPT-40, ask questions. In this case, what I want to extract is procedures. So all of these things that you see that have a bounding box are like spans, and these are what we want to extract or classify. In this use case, we want to classify and extract procedures out of specific tables, which are schedule of study or schedule of activity tables. These are based on clinical trial protocol documents, and procedures could be anything like informed context or randomization. These are the procedures that appeared or happened in these documents, and we want to basically do some uh, downstream analysis. For example, is the number of procedures correlated to the number of patients dropping out, et cetera? So in the first place, we really need to extract this type of information. And doing this by hand is very time consuming, but what we can do is to leverage all this data-centric approach and programmatic labeling to be able to quickly label data and train an ML model that then can do this uh, task much, much faster. If I want to extract procedures here, I can go to the prompt tool and ask the GPT-40 model, what are the procedures that are mentioned here? And GPT will give me some answers, but it won't be perfect, or it may not cover all of my data points. I already won, uh, ran one um, FM-based PDF uh, here, and uh, the precision was 100%, but it was only uh, able to cover 0.7% of the data, which is small. But then you can add in other sources of signal or labeling functions that I will show you now. For example, we can uh, create this heuristic or rule based on if the span is like three lines after the regex pattern page, then uh, both uh, class other. It means that if there is something or a span three lines after the class page, then it, it's not a procedure. Usually we have something page 30 of 35 and anything below that both it wouldn't be around procedure. It's just going to belong to class other. This is one example. The other types of example is that you can use the dimension of the uh, page to uh, create these labeling function. So we can say procedures are usually things that appear on the left side of the page or left side of the table. So we can say if and there is something on the right side of the table, that should belong to class other. So we can easily like have all of these dimensions for each one of these spans and use that to create a labeling function. For example, here that I've hovered over a screen, I know where is the left pixel, right pixel, top and bottom pixel. And then I want to say if the left is bigger than a number, it means that it's on the right side. So let's vote class other. And by auto-tune, we can uh, automatically figure the best number to use here. And then another example is uh, by using some logic around things that appear in the same row. Here is an example. Because by looking at these, you see that the procedures usually occur in the same row as there is an X. X means that, uh, for example, this procedure uh, was done on this, uh, you know, at the screen time or at baseline, et cetera. So we can directly encode this knowledge as a, another labeling function. Uh, let me click on view correct here to say, to show you how and where this is correct. So basically the labeling function that I have written here is to say, if there is something, if the span is in the same row as X, and also it's not X itself, because you know it could also tag X as a procedure, which we don't want. So if it's in the same row as X and it's not X itself, then label that as class procedure. And you see that it's getting a lot of good procedures, but for example, it didn't get this telephone visit because there is no X here. But you can cover that with other labeling functions as well. Precision is 75%. Sometimes this is wrong, but the coverage is high. But this is all fine. We want to just like use all of the sources of signal that we can find to uh, create this label training data. The label model will take care of aggregating the uh, results from different labeling functions. And this is the same workflow as the other use case that I showed you. You go ahead and train a model. You look at the error analysis and figure out where the model is wrong and go back and make improvements in your labeling functions, train a new model, and see how the model is being able to improve in performance. And then lastly, I wanted to show you another example on drugs and adverse event extraction. 
So if you wanted to extract specific parts of the text, so this is not PDF, this is just sample text, but we want to figure out where there is a mention of a drug or adverse event. For example, here, we know that naproxen is a drug, but then we have to have a model trained to be able to find out uh, naproxen is here, it's this character offset, and this is a drug. So this is a sequence tagging task, and you can uh, use the same approach. It's all about creating the right labeling functions. You can go in prompt, you can leverage the large language models, for example, deep sets, or you can add other models that you think would be relevant here and ask questions like what are the drugs mentioned in this text? And whenever it finds something is a drug, then label that as class drug. So this is one way of just like prompting and see how it will uh, performs uh, out of the box. Yeah, so we see that the precision is low. It's not like uh, correct uh, all the time. It makes a lot of incorrect predictions. This is not a good thing. We just can't use this deep set Roberta model out of the box, but we can save this as one source of labeling function. And then the next thing is that we can create a whole set of different labeling functions in this case. For example, we can use dictionaries. I found one dictionary online. BC5CDR is an online public a dictionary of different chemical terms that I just uh, imported here. And then it will find out in the text, whatever uh, match it found with this dictionary, it will tag it as class drug. So for example, cholesterol is also mentioned in this dictionary, but we don't need uh, cholesterol as one you know, drug. It's fine. We can write other labeling functions to get rid of them, but at the high level, we can uh, include any in-house or public dictionaries as one source of signal. So whenever it found any pattern matches to anything in that dictionary, it will vote that as class a drug. Or adverse event, you can have the same thing. You can also use Spacey's output to say that if Spacey thought something is a verb or a determiner or something like that, it's not a drug or adverse event. It should belong to class other. So you can use this uh, logic as well. Also, you can use the output of other hugging face models. So for example, you can have a BioBert or CyBert, uh, which are more uh, popular in the medical domain uh, to say that if, for example, BioBert or CyBert are saying something is a drug, let's just keep that output as one source of labeling function. So I've just like gone ahead, I, I'm reading CyBert from hugging face and then CyBert is being applied to my data. It may say something is a drug or not. I'm using that output as one source of signal here. So you're really not bound to anything. You can just like use all different things that you think may be relevant here. And another thing that I wanted to mention here is that you can use public ontologies. So for example, if uh, you want to check with a public website like a Wikidata or a Bioportal to check something is actually a drug or not, you can do that as well. We can query the website based on each one of these data points. So for example, I have pseudoporphyria here. I can go ahead and quickly query this field in the Bioportal webpage and the page that shows up, if it contains the right ontology, so for uh, uh, symptoms, we are looking for CSSO, SYMP or Q uh, OAE, then we say that it's actually a um, symptom or an adverse event and we can use it. For drugs, we are looking at Rx norm or DRON. If there are other things that you think are relevant, we can use them here as well. But basically, I also wanted to show you that you have the access to uh, do the ontology mapping with public uh, data points as well. And here, the, the way you're seeing this is like in a code based. And I wanted to mention that you are not limited to the labeling functions that are here. You can write more complex LFs uh, via the notebook or SDK functions that we have. So you can use the notebook for either creating a labeling functions, adding an LLM to that drop down menu, or adding new models that you want to use for training. So that's all possible. And then the very, very last thing that I wanted to mention here is that the SMEs or data scientists get to use um, some of these uh, functionalities like tagging or putting comments. So for example, if they're looking at this data point and they're not sure why a class drug has been mentioned or something like that, they can just put a uh, put a comment here. So it, it shows my name, where, when I put this comment and what my comment is. And you can also put a tag, like if there is a like wrong adverse event, or if you want to check something with SME, that's also possible.
Okay, this was uh, the demo that I wanted to show on different use cases, different data types. And uh, let me go through this at the summary part where the data is really the medium for transferring subject matter expertise to a model. Manual labeling has fundamentally scalability uh, constraints, but programmatic labeling is what makes AI and data development look more like software development. And snorkel flow makes programmatic labeling available at enterprise scale. And for more information, uh, please ask any questions that you may have right now and email us at info at snorkel.ai. And there are a lot of blogs on our website and please reach out uh, on social like Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Thank you for listening. Great. Well, that was amazing, Nazanin. And uh, we covered a lot. So if folks do want to see uh, a demo or see Snorkel Flow on their data, I do encourage you to reach out to us at uh, info at snorkel.ai, or you can always go to our website uh, and request a demo and the team would be happy uh, to learn more about your use case and your data. And I know we've covered a lot today. I do see a couple of questions coming in. Um, feel free to ask questions that you have and we'll go through those. Uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes more here for questions. So uh, let's jump in, uh, Nazanin. Uh, the first question is from Matthew. Uh, he's wondering, how do how does programmatic labeling functions perform against data sets that are heavily inference-based, moderately incomplete, i.e. Uh, subsurface imaging data, electromagnetic surveys? So I would say like the, the platform works best um, against like text data. So that would be something that we work and also images. I'm not sure about the subsurface imaging data, but that's something that we can uh, follow up with you. We have another question Does around he... generating the ground truth data set. Snorkel also have an annotation tool for generating the ground truth uh, for the test data set. We have a, an annotation suite where only the annotators can see like the data and the labels that they have to give to the data points. So you don't need to do that annotation outside of the platform. Let me just quickly show you how that works. So what we were, we were in the develop a studio where like data scientists are mainly spending time on creating labeling functions, training a model. But we also have this annotate page where you get to see like the different annotators that are going to do annotations like Adam, Alex, et cetera. Like what is the label distribution? You get to see their inter annotator agreement as well. And then in the batches is where you can create different batches of the data for the annotators to go through and uh, give some annotations. Here in this batch, I can show you how it looks. So the annotator will only see the data there. They don't, uh, they don't have to go and, you know, create labeling functions here. They just see the text and then they can go and uh, assign the right ground truth for that. That can be used in the test data. We have a question. What percentage accuracy, precision recall, et cetera, do you need the programmatic labeling to get to, to be able to train a high performing model? Uh, and then a little clarification to result in a high-performing model. Are there any heuristics you can share? It really depends. I mean, we usually try to start by writing la labeling functions. It doesn't need to be perfect either. Like the precision recall can be around like 60, 70 percent and have some coverage. But it's really like giving that enough signal through the error-guided analysis so that the model will perform well at the end. It's really a trade-off between precision and coverage, but we want to start somewhere and really trying to gather all sorts of signal we have by consulting with a subject matter expert. And then we re really realize from the model's performance, like where the model is lacking in terms of enough representative data so that we can go back and create the right labeling functions with the right uh, precision and coverage. From your perspective, uh, how accessible are labeling functions and programmatic labeling to non-data scientists? Uh, non-data scientists or like the more uh, like non-technical people can also discuss with the um, data scientists in like how to create those labeling functions. Basically from the LF builders is where if there are like non-technical people, they can go ahead and just like transfer their knowledge uh, into very simple labeling functions. So from this UI, if if they want to really, they can just either share their feedback or insights around like how to create that labeling functions, or it's just like a really small learning process for them to say that if they're uh, thinking about a specific regex or a pattern, et cetera, they can just put it down here. Uh, choose the right label and then preview how that labeling function works. So through this UI, it's really made it easier for the non-technical people to also tinker around with different uh, various ways to create that labeling function. And I know you hit on it and you had a nice slide. Um, it is a common question. What would you say the difference between rules and labeling functions are? The, the labeling functions um, can also include rules. So the labeling functions can be different heuristics, rules, dictionaries, large language models. But at the end, what's important is how to aggregate those labeling functions into the final programmatic label. And it's all through the label model approach that we've published a lot of papers and research 
uh, on the best approaches to really find out how to trust different labeling functions, uh, how to aggregate agreements and disagreements, and come up with the final confidence weighted label that will be useful for training the final ML model. Person asks, does Snorkel help with finding the most suitable representative relevant labels before starting the labeling process? It's not about ground truth, just about defining the labels, uh, more like a taxonomy problem in the demo Nesian shared uh, some fix 50 to 70 possible labels, but how do we find those? Yeah, that's a good question. You may be thinking about the task and you may have something in mind by just discussing with your subject matter experts, like I have these 10 labels in mind, but I don't know, maybe there are more that I don't know. So throughout this iterative process, you can figure out uh, the model is making a mistake on some pattern of data. And then you can figure out, okay, maybe this belongs to a new class. And what we can do in Snorkel is quickly go and uh, select, like merge these two classes or uh, try to uh, split this class into several different classes. And we've seen this with other customers as well, that we started with 10 uh, labels at the beginning or taxonomy, but then we tried to expand it to more like 15 or 20 because we figured out through this process that more labels, more granular labels will be better to uh, explain our data set. And I think that's you know really where the error analysis and the iterative approach, I don't remember if the slide uh, was in there with the iterative loop, but I think that's really where that does come into play. Yes, exactly. So uh, we, we do this discovery guided error analysis and then through programmatic uh, and the feedback really that we're getting from the data and the model is where we understand whether we have to um, add more labels, split them, merge them, delete them, and do this really quickly. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, so I think with that, we will wrap up today's event. Uh, so again, if you have uh, stayed with us, thank you so much for joining today. You're going to see that uh, survey pop up in your browser from Zoom. Uh, so please do take a moment to give your immediate feedback on today's event. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, we will be sending out the recording of today's event. And feel free to share that with your colleagues. Uh, we'd love to learn more about your projects and your data. So feel free to reach out to us at snorkel.ai slash demo. You can request a demo. Additionally, a member of the Snorkel team will be in touch, uh, and they will be able to answer additional questions you have uh, or schedule a personalized demo. And if you're lucky, you might even have uh, Nazanin join you uh, on that demo. So thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, and I guess one last plug. Uh, we do have several webinars coming up uh, at the end of this month. Uh, they're very exciting events. The next one's going to be uh, on aligning LLMs, and there'll be a demo component to that as well. You can always find those events at snorkel.ai slash events. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.